good evening everyone and uh, i welcome you all for this special impri panel discussion on art democracies uh, mostly majoritarian and we are so uh, uh, gladful to have a very distinguished panel with us and uh, i will I, i also uh, uh, wish all of you a happy republic day and uh, and uh, <clears throat> so thankful that we are having this discussion at this time uh, uh, so without any further ado let me introduce the panelists for today anshula why don't you go on yes uh, good evening everyone and welcome to this panel discussion um we have with us today our chair and moderator professor ajay gudavarthi he is associate professor at the center for political studies of jawaharlal nehru university new delhi uh, professor gudavarthi taught earlier as assistant professor at the national law school of india university bangalore he had been visiting fellow center for citizenship civil society and rule of law at the university of aberdeen in 2012 he was visiting faculty at the center for human rights university of hyderabad in 2011 and visiting fellow at goldsmith college university of london in 2010 in 2008 he was charles wallace visiting fellow at the school of oriental and african studies soas london his published works include reframing democracy and agency in india interrogating political society edited 2012 and politics of post civil society contemporary history of political movements in india page publications new delhi 2013 our panelists for today are dr trevor stack and professor nicholas tambio dr trevor stack uh, came to the came to the university of aberdeen as a lecturer in spanish and latin american studies in 2002 after completing a ba in history and a masters in social anthropology at oxford university a phd in anthropology at the university of pennsylvania and having taught anthropology at the university of st andrews he has been doing research in mexico since 1992 and has also done research since 2008 in the east bay area of northern california his research has focused mainly on aspects of citizenship and civil society as well as teaching in spanish and latin american studies dr stack is director of the interdisciplinary Center for Citizenship, Civil Society, and Rule of Law (CISRUL), which focuses on the study of political concepts in the world. He led a large RCUK Newton team project on societal responses to crime and violence in Mexico (2016 to 19), and currently leads an EU Marie Curie co-fund grant, "Political Concepts in the World (2018 to 23). which funds 11 phd fellowships together with related training and conferences he is also mentor of a leo hon early career fellowship 2019 to 22 held by hafi baris a former cis rul phd from september to december 2019 dr stack was jadwood excellence initiative visiting professor in anthropology and development studies at jadwood university in the netherlands he published knowing history in mexico an ethnography of citizenship 2012 and edited the volumes religion as a category of governance and sovereignty 2015 and breaching the civil order radicalism and the civil sphere 2020 we also have with us as a panelist dr nicholas tampio he is a professor of political science at fordham university he is history of political thought contemporary political theory and education policy His first book, Kantian Courage, considers how Anglo-American, continental, and Islamic political theorists renovate Kant's critical philosophy. Dr. Tampio's second book, Deleuze's Political Vision, explains why a thousand plateaus ought to enter the political theory canon. His third book is Common Core: National Education Standards and the Threat to Democracy, and his fourth book. Learning vs. the Common Core collects articles about education that he has published in Eon, CNN, The Conversation, U.S. News, and World Report, and other outlets. He is the political theory editor of Politics and Religion, and the co-editor in chief of Comparative Political Theory. He is presently writing a book on teaching political theory for Edward Elgar Publishing. Dr. Tampio serves as the faculty mentor of the Fordham Political Review and the department's Pi Sigma Alpha chapter. His work has been translated into Albanian, Chinese, Croatian, French, 
Hebrew, Italian, Japanese, Persian, Portuguese, Spanish, Turkish, and Vietnamese. His essay, Look Up From Your Screen, is included in the Norton Reader alongside essays by Maya Angelou, Frederick Douglass, and Benjamin Franklin. Uh, I warmly welcome uh, both our panelists uh, for today, and I welcome the audience to this discussion. And with that, I hand it over to Dr. Gudavarthi to take it forward. Yes. Welcome, everyone. Good hour, sir. You can, yes. Now proceed with yours. Thank you, Arjun. Thank you. This uh, credit of uh, organizing this should go to Arjun, who has uh, who is the young director of uh, the center, and uh, they're quite uh, uh, energized to organize these events quite frequently uh, and uh, on a range of uh, themes, contemporary themes. Uh, given the general situation in India and most other places, <clears throat> uh, uh, it's, it's a welcome thing that uh, we seem to be discussing majoritarianism uh, today. Uh, so I welcome both uh, Professor Tampio, who I met uh, a few years back. Uh, I think in Kharagpur was the first time we met in IIT Kharagpur and then of course in the U in US when I was in New York and uh, we have been keeping in touch. And uh, our second panelist, Trevor, is a good friend who has been uh, to India, but of course also, I think I've been more frequently to Aberdeen than uh, Trevor has been to India. <laughs> so we have been uh, good friends for quite some time now. I think, I don't know, maybe 10 years or more. And uh, Arjun has some good pictures of uh, all of us together here. Uh, Trevor, if you remember, that picture of ours was clicked by your son uh, at the beach. <laughs> so with that, let me now uh, come out to the today's topic that we, uh, when Arjun suggested that he wishes to organize, and this is the topic I suggested, that uh, uh, today we seem to be in a global context where uh, democracies are increasingly being referred to across globe from uh, with the rise of Trump in United States, to Erdogan in Turkey, to Modi in India, and Brexit uh, in much of Europe, uh, uh, that uh, they are majoritarian uh, in some sense, and that often overlaps with the idea of they being illiberal. Uh, so the idea behind organizing this really was to sort of uh, interrogate what do we mean by when we say democracies are majoritarian. I think it, it, it's, it's uh, quite a tricky and uh, a kind of a very convoluted and conceptually very slippery kind of a thing that what exactly do we mean when we say democracies are uh, majoritarian. And my own hunch is that it seems to hide uh, more than what it reveals and uh, enables us in understanding certain trends. That what do, does it really help us in calling democracies majoritarian if, if it does, in what sense uh, is it conceptually, politically, uh, useful to call democracy the majority uh, I think the first sense, we, the most obvious sense that we mean democracies are majoritarian is obviously in terms of a, a numerical majority. That uh, when a numerical majority gets consolidated, uh, then we seem to refer to, uh, but democracies, uh, uh, representative democracies, parliamentary democracies are supposed to conjure up uh, these majorities. Uh, so what exactly is the problem there? If you know, if uh, Trump is elected uh, by a majority, or if Narendra Modi here is uh, elected by a majority, uh, in itself that uh, doesn't seem to uh, be a problem. That in fact, in one sense, is a success of uh, democracy. What is a the problem there? Is there illiberal? Uh, so it's a crisis of liberalism rather than a crisis of democracy. So do we actually make this uh, category mistake? Uh, in uh, uh, calling something majoritarian and this alarmist trend that we demonstrate is not actually a crisis of democracy, but it's more of a crisis of liberalism, which is a different kind of a crisis, which needs a different kind of an interrogation, and uh, it's not a crisis of democracy. Uh, so in this first sense, democ uh, majoritarian becomes, I think, conceptually a very slippery concept. The second sense in which we seem to use uh, the idea of majoritarian is uh, not necessarily in terms of a, a numerical majority, but actually it is in terms of a numerical minority, uh, but uh, socially and economically dominant social groups, when they begin to trust their interests, 
uh, their uh, 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 no uh, sectoral interest uh, uh, then we we actually begin to call it so it could be white supermasses in the united states it could be the caste hindu uh, majority uh, which is majority in this sense are actually the numerically a minority but when we use this majority in the second sense we are actually referring to their social and economically uh, dominant position where they seem to be forcefully thrusting uh, their interest uh, uh, no, uh, through electoral uh, mechanisms through available uh, institutions or it could be by undermining constitutionalism and liberal institutions so in the second sense majoritarianism seem to be referring to uh, uh, interest of tiny social elites uh and and then that, uh, that that and which is being forcefully sort of rubbed off on all other sections of the society the third uh, sense really uh, which i think is which is what i think takes the populist turn uh, nick and i have, we were we have been discussing this for some time now that where uh, the interest of the dominant uh, social groups like in indian case the caste hindu what we generally refer in popular parlance as the brahmanical uh, hindu vision becomes popular acceptable uh, to a large sections of what are generally referred to as subaltern social groups including the dalit the obcs and um, and in the third sense then majoritarianism becomes a certain kind of a convergence of uh, dominant social vision of dominant social elites becoming acceptable Uh, to uh, to a range of social subaltern groups and uh, and then in the third case uh, majoritarianism would actually mean more of consent than coercion uh, so where is the problem then in the third kind of a case and i see i think populism uh, that we keep referring to is the third variant of majoritarianism where the interest of the regime uh, at the core might reflect certain corporate economic interests it could refer to hindu brahmanical interest in the united states it could be white supermasses interest but can draw support from uh, various other sections including the economically weak within the dominant and though not the case of trump was directly linked to uh, the rust belt crisis and therefore it is not just the elite economically powerful white but it's actually the disempowered uh, disempowered uh, working class uh, right so so that those are the three definitions we could sort of put on table and see uh, which of them is actually the problematic one and uh, why should majoritarian in this sense uh, 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 so that it there none of these definitions seems to really produce an unproblematic kind of a case to dismiss a majoritarianism because the assumption seems to be democracies need to do this kind of a thing and when they actually begin to do uh, we seem to have a problem with democracy Uh, so there is something very slippery here i find uh, therefore i often say that populism needs to be i think very carefully sort of uh, peeled and uh, analyzed my second point would be are these majorities i think the point uh, even trevor uh, was interested in sort of exploring here was that are these majorities uh, manufactured one of the critique that often comes up is that uh, these majorities are a kind of uh, uh, not historically available but are sort of uh, manufactured by current uh, political populist political regime for instance in the indian case uh, we are told that the category of the hindu uh, is not an ancient category it is in fact was invented through colonial censuses in the 19th century as late as 19th century uh, and therefore the uh, and it was some would argue those who are critical would argue that uh, this category uh, was uh, was manufactured Uh, to divert the interest uh, or to include the subaltern whose interests don't align with the hindu but actually the category of the hindu represents uh, the interest of the dominant uh, brahmanical social classes uh, and therefore uh, majoritarianism is actually manufactured uh, one needs to then pause and think that identities i think are always manufactured there is nothing natural about any identity so all identities are manufactured uh what exactly is the problem if the hindu as an identity is manufactured in the current context i mean it, it represents a certain kind of a solidarity it uh, it represents a certain alignment with the idea of the nation so on and so forth uh, 
only problem one one foot part of kind of uh, point towards is that uh, these are manufactured through state mechanisms through legal mechanisms like census and uh, policies is that the problem that we are referring to when we say uh, majorities are manufactured and not uh, socially or historically or naturally available uh, in society uh, and as i said the counter could be that uh, all identities are manufactured whether big or small uh, uh, and therefore uh, to imagine that these uh, uh, manufactured identities are in a necessary conflict with uh, uh, smaller identities uh, i think i find is uh, is not politically uh, uh, is not capturing the reality in, in a political sense as again as i have argued in my own work that in indian case micro identities of dalit sub caste uh, i think are uh, are very much finding their representation within this manufactured larger meta identity of being a hindu so this old uh, assumption that manufacturing larger uh, identities the what we call the majority and identities necessarily displace the micro identities uh, in today's uh, context of technology media representative democracy many factors i will not have the time to get into all of that uh, uh, i think uh, might be slightly misplaced that uh, even if we put hypothetically what if smaller groups find a representation under this meta identity why should manufacturing even assuming they are manufactured in what sense are they really problematic why should a hindu identity not be as much available uh, to pol politics as let's say a sub caste uh, caste or ethnic or linguistic uh, identity my third uh, point would be uh, i think again this is a point that trevor would i think may want to elaborate is that uh, when we actually refer to this majoritarianism are we actually uh, uh, hinting at something else uh, but this is a term more of a convenience uh, rather than uh, what happens under the name of majoritarianism in concrete if you see uh, is not limited to these uh, ethnic religious uh, identities but it is more about uh, certain kinds of new uh, patron client patronage networks that are Uh, outside state policy outside state institutions outside democratic institutions uh, which are uh, para legal which could be illegal which uh, which actually refer to growing crime and corruption and pa para legality that exists in all democracies so uh, trevor and i we have discussed this patha chatterjee's political society at this rule i think i don't know how many times that uh, there are all democracies manufacture uh, black economies all ec economies all democracies manufacture para legal uh, drug in latin america has drug narcotics there is crime there is corruption uh, therefore actually what happens in the concrete the political economy of majoritarianism is in terms of these extra legal extra institutional activities uh, and that's what precisely is happening in indian context too that uh, while they talk about hindu uh, solidarity we can see what is happening is that the rss is actually filling its own network whether it is democratic whether it's educational institutions whether it's electoral roles it is literally like occupying these institutions through their own networks which they give uh, the hindu color but what happens in the concrete uh, is actually in terms of uh, replacing the old networks uh, through this new network and therefore giving the same kind of processes of crime and corruption that exists in almost all states in india which is again witnessed visible in this ongoing electoral campaign in bengal uh, nowhere which is known for this kind of uh, violence and corruption and uh, patronage networks of uh, parties uh, uh, they they sort of proliferate under this new hindu thing but the same process continues So actually, majority again, in, even in this context, majoritarianism does not capture this political economy process. It actually waylays us and you know uh, takes our attention somewhere else. My last point, uh, uh, which is what I'm working on right now, uh, just written a piece uh, for Telegraph, and uh, is that does majoritarianism lead to what I call as democratization by default? 
uh, uh, that majoritarian is what we are referring to as a phenomenon of majoritarianism across globe in democracy. Is there a possibility that this, uh, this, if we call this a certain kind of a technology, if we say this, are, this is a certain kind of a strategization, a set of strategies and processes, uh, is there something that we are missing simply in offering a critique, but actually on the ground, uh, it is a kind of a correction to uh, a certain kind of lopsided processes that have existed in a liberal democracy. Is it therefore possible uh, to sort of uh, read uh, what we're referring to majority? And is there a possibility that this kind of majoritarianism can lead to uh, democratization by default? For instance, in the United States context, uh, Trump's popularity was in fact, he revived the economy, uh, he brought in a certain kind of protectionism, uh, he addressed the problems of the uh, white working class, which was not happening otherwise, uh, whether through uh, Democrat parties or uh, through, because of the crisis of neoliberalism. Similarly, in the Indian context, I find it, which is far more complex, that a range of issues that were that that had a certain kind of a bottleneck, uh, you know, whether it is a gender issue within the religious minorities, whether it was a question of uh, uh, subcaste. Uh, within uh, Dalit and uh, OBCs, uh, whether it's a question of corrupt regional leaders and uh, rep a question of representation, uh, all these questions which I think the old kind of secular constitutionalism could not really address uh, had kind of a stalemate, for instance, between gender rights and minority rights was settled by offering Muslims uh, personal laws and that, uh, that remained a kind of an unending uh, debate that uh, led us nowhere. But I see what uh, that majoritarianism by pushing, even for sense of optics, even if it is meant to sort of disempower the religious minorities, uh, uh, in spite of all of that, does majoritarianism, can one read this uh, option of taking us beyond the kind of centrism, that, uh, which is what Chantal Mook refers to as the rise of populism is some kind of a, a critique, attack against, a backlash against uh, liberal technocratic centrism, which kind of brought in an artificial consensus between contesting groups, and therefore it was an hegemony of its own kind. Uh, it was uh, serving the dominant interests of its own kind. Uh, and majoritarianism, in, uh, even, if we, even in giving an optics of uh, sort of uh, unsettling all that uh, through its anti-elitist, extra-institutional discourse, seem to be, to my mind, at least in the Indian context that I'm fi uh, following closely, opening up new spaces that did not exist uh, uh, in post-independence Indian history uh, for about 50 years. Suddenly, we are today able to debate the gender question more openly uh, within religious minorities or within caste groups uh, than we could do before. We are able to talk about the, what about the representation about various other sub-castes uh, beyond the dominant uh, caste within the backward caste and Dalits. Similarly, the regional uh, uh, question of corrupt regional elites, all these questions have suddenly sort of sprung up and which I feel, I think I, I'm referring to it uh, provisionally as democratization by default. So those are my very provisional tentative initial remarks. With that, I would now open it up uh, for both the panelists. Who would want to go first? Is it, uh, uh, I don't know who is senior whether it is Nick or <laughs> if you want to follow the seniority, I, I don't know <laughs> who, who would be senior age-wise. <laughs> Trevor, do you have a preference? I'm fine either way. Uh, why don't you go first, uh, Nicholas? Okay, all right, wonderful. Well, um, thank you very much for the invitation to be part of this conversation. Um, and uh, Ajay, you're a great friend, and I also read all of your work as soon as it comes out. Um, I think it's very thought-provoking and uh, interesting for an American to see what's the same and what's different in, in, in India. And uh, I also just you know, very grateful to meet the other people on this panel and in the audience. Um, so I think the question is the right question. I think it's the exact question that we need to be thinking about right now. And uh, the short answer is no, that uh, if you believe in uh, democratic theory, you have to differentiate democracy from majoritarianism. And one of the first books I read in college was Democracy and Its Critics by Robert Dahl. And a big part of that book is differentiating democracy from majoritarianism. So um, 
plenty of people the sort of the folk understanding of democracy means uh, the majority plus one. Uh, but for people who spend their lives thinking about it, you realize that democracy, uh, there's a much richer sense. And what I'll try to do, I'm not giving an academic talk, but I'll try to, I'll try to indicate some of the, the thinking that political theorists have had uh, on the topic. So I'll, I'll, I'll keep my examples mostly to the United States. I know that example the most. Um, so as everybody in the world knows, uh, Donald Trump won the presidency in 2016. But what many people also know is that he didn't win the popular election, that the way that America was structured, the original constitutional compromise is that uh, certain states got electoral colleges. It just made sure that uh, the rural states were represented. And so the fact is, is that Hillary Clinton got many more votes on the coast, but the way that the system is structured is that Trump became the president. So he never had just a clear majority for, for the in, entire country. What explains uh, Trump's support? Uh, people have been debating it for a while. Thomas Frank, uh, he would say that uh, he wrote an article in The Guardian a long time ago saying that if you actually listen to Trump in his speeches, what he largely talks about is economics and about how globalization hurts the working class. Um, and the fact is, is that on the left, the for a long time, left has been protectionist, that the right, and, you know, the big business wants workers and products to come in for cheap and the labor unions have often been sort of pushing, saying, no, let's keep the, let's not let the markets flood with cheap labor. So you can make an argument that this is Thomas Frank's argument that there was part of Trump that resonated with a certain sort of popular sentiment about protecting middle class jobs. Um, Trump, of course, said lots of things that skirted racism. My friends would say he's clearly racist. So he, there was the the uh, there was a midnight march in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, and there was some violence in Charlottesville, Virginia, and um, you know there were certain people uh, invoking the Ku Klux Klan and the Confederacy. And Donald Trump famously said, infamously said, there are good people on both sides. And so uh, lots of my friends will say, boom, evidence, he's racist. And I would say that, well, if you look all around the world, what you see are populists trying to own the libs. I don't know if they have that phrase in, in India, but basically like strong leaders are trying to show that they're not gonna play by the rules of the liberal elites. So they're going to, so that's, I mean, for me, that's what, um, that's what Trump was a master at for four years on Twitter, maybe longer, is just going straight to that, that edge and sometimes going over it a little bit. But basically, um, if my interpretation, people disagree, is that he's from Queens. He doesn't care about the Confederacy, right? And he's too self-centered to even be a racist, if you ask me, um, right? He's not gonna be part of any group that, he's not gonna be part of any group that constrains his behavior. He's just such a narcissist um, that, that he does, it's not, it's giving him too much credit to say he's part of a movement, even if that movement is something as reprehens reprehensible as racism. So I, the way I view Trump is that he's more of a populist than a uh, that uh, than just a straight up racist. And uh, there have been scholarship, and what populists are are people who claim to speak for the silent majority. So it's um, strong men primarily, I'm not sure if there are any populist women leaders, but basically populist men leaders say that all these Ivy League educated lawyers and bankers are making it hard for honest people to earn a living and you don't have to do anything. So if you ask me, it's not democratic. It's not act asking the demos to have croxy. It's not asking the people to have power. It's saying, trust the leader to have power. Um, and one of your points is, well, what's, what you're seeing in, in around the world is that minorities say, hey, listen, that sounds kind of attractive. And so in, uh, in America, we have Mexican-Americans in the Rio Grande who support Trump. And, you know, some of my friends are going ballistic, are getting very angry, trying to say, well, wait a minute, why are Mexican-Americans supporting Trump when he says so many things that seem to be anti-immigrant, anti-Mexican-American? Well, I would say that uh, the reason is complicated, but 
One is that they, you know, there's some, maybe some, some legitimate points. Maybe they're afraid of crime, you know, maybe they're afraid of violence. And I think if you're going to be honest, you should acknowledge that that's a real concern, right? There have been plenty of uh, gang killings on Long Island, pretty near where I live. So I don't think it serves anybody's interest to just ignore those sort of legitimate points. But I think there's also this desire to be associated with a strong leader. So, and I would, you know, maybe you could tell me if there's a similar dynamic with the OBCs and the Dalits in India with Modi. Maybe, um, maybe he speaks for some of their legitimate grievances. Maybe they, maybe there's some uh, an attraction to be part of Hindutva rather than hanging out with Muslims. You know, I'm very much writing in pencil. You, you'll have to tell me if that's the, the right reading. So what's the, what's the right response? What's the correct response to populism? Well, in America, I would say the Democratic Party, they, they've got a two-handed, two, uh, two kinds of strategies. One strategy is to just show how smart they are and say, finally, adults are in charge. Um, by, there's an article uh, about how Biden is support, surrounded himself with uh, people who went to the Ivy Leagues so pretty much everybody around him went to Harvard or Yale or Princeton. Um, and so th that's the one level, just smart people, technocracy. And then the other is uh, wokeness. And I wrote, I published an article this year in Market Watch on wokeness. And wokeness is just a new term for an old thing, which is moral righteousness, right? Which is people just sort of elevating themselves above others by sort of talking about their moral goodness. But what I would say in, um, in America right now, it often has the form of sort of finding out the position on gender and race, uh, transgender, and sort of going as far as possible. Sometimes, you know, and trying to go farther, farther, and farther until, um, you know, you just, you just go to a position that, if you ask me sometimes, uh, just becomes really strains credulity. Um, so in America right now, we're having a, a big debate about the 1619 project, which was uh, New York Times. They uh, published some articles sort of trying to retell American history. And one of the arguments of the 1619 project is that uh, racism is part of America's DNA. So America's racist DNA. And just for me, that's a terrible concept, right? Racist DNA, like, like, do you look at a micro, do you look through a microscope and see racist DNA? Or is it a metaphor that people are racist and can never not be racist? So, so for me that, that um, the, the Democratic Party in America, if you ask me sometimes is, uh, is sort of this elitism and moral superiority that is not small D democratic. Democrat, and so maybe I should talk a little bit about what I think democracy is. So democracy is not majoritarianism. It's not, it's not Trump voters plus one. It's not Biden voters plus one. So let's try to figure out just a little bit about what democracy is. And here, one of my heroes is uh, this man named John Dewey. And there's this new collection just published by Columbia University Press on some of uh, Dewey's public writing. So Ajay, if you're thinking about these issues and you don't have enough to read, you know, maybe, maybe take a look at this book because Dewey, Dewey's great. And, one of the things that Dewey would say is democracy is a way of life. And what it is, it's a way of showing people respect. And it's a way of uh, listening to people. And so for democracy, it means that everybody has a voice. So majoritarianism is that the majority has a voice, but democracy is everybody has a voice. And democracy is this assumption of respect towards other people, right? So racism is one very, you know, anti-democratic way of being in the world. But elitism and wokeism can be anti-democratic if it means that like, you don't have to listen to other people, right? So I, I, you know, generated a Facebook controversy when I said, you know, I think we should listen to people going to the Trump protest and try to figure out what some of their legitimate grievances are. And some of my friends said, no, you cannot listen to them, right? I have nothing to say for them. I have, excuse me, I have nothing to learn from them. And I said, well, you know, all right, that's your, that's your call. And I think, I think some friends think that I'm a Trump supporter. I'm not, 
But I do think that if you're going to have a democratic society, you have to listen to people who you disagree with. Um, and uh, so maybe uh, it's two, two points just to respond to you, Ajay, to continue our conversation. Um, one is the relationship between liberalism and democracy. I would say that liberalism means leaving people alone. And it's from the Greek word eleutheros, separate. And uh, Isaiah Berlin talked about this as negative freedom. So liberalism means letting people be who are different. And I would say that democracy is about croxy. It's about power and it's about positive freedom. And it means, so what democracy means is you want to involve as many people as you can to participate in the political order. So it's not 50, it's not 50 percent plus one. It's everybody. You have to figure out a way. And so what uh, it's a governmental system with federalism and uh, different avenues of power, but it's also a culture in which you, um, for example, try not to make fun of other people. Right. Calling other people names is a really bad habit. And it doesn't matter what political party you're part of. That uh, part of democracy means taking a deep breath biting your tongue and, and, you know, and listening and speaking respectfully, even to people you might be pretty angry with at the moment. Um, I'll just, this will be my final point. Uh, this, I, this morning and other days I've been reading your essay um, about, uh, shoot, I just closed the screen, but basically about uh, the uh, anti-majoritarianism uh, spirituality or anti-majoritarianism uh, 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 self. And I think you know it's you're absolutely right that we all have to work on ourselves to uh, to to not want to be part of this dominant crowd that dominates other people. So maybe there's something within us that wants to oppress other human beings, but I think we need to try to check that in ourselves. So um, that's where I thought that you were 100% on the right track. I guess what I would just add is that. Um, there's a difference between ethics and politics. Ethics is when you're working on yourself. Politics is when you're working with other people. That for me, it's very much a political, it's a very much a political question. And that's part of the point that I was making about some of the Trump protesters uh, on January 6th is that sometimes they have legitimately been excluded from power. And so that they're very desperately trying to get some power. And so one approach is to tell them to, you know, call them names, fascists, or, or say you guys should be quiet, or you have nothing to say, or you could try to figure out, all right, well, how do we redesign uh, American institutions? How do we rethink American culture? That people have the, a realist, a real uh, sense based on a real thing that they do have some voice about how their kids are educated, about how American history is told, about, um, about sort of just various aspects of American culture and, and politics. You gotta feel like you have some sort of say. And then what I would just, final thought is that creating this anti-majoritarian ethos is requires practices, collective practices. And just in my own, uh, when, you, when I was in Karikpur and in my own thinking, you know, that's one of the things I'm very much thinking about is how can you create a, how can you create habits that encourage uh, a democratic way of being in the world. And um, uh, I, uh, that's a very much an early stage of the project. I'm just gonna throw this out there as, the, for me, that's the big question right now. It's, it's how do we cultivate democratic habits? All right, I'll finish for now, thank you. Thanks, Nick, for that very sharp and pointed uh, <clears throat> intervention and uh, 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 I will offer my comments after Trevor, we can take both together and then we will kind of uh, get back to both of you. Over to you, Trevor. Thank you. Um, and uh, well, many thanks first to Arjun Kumar for the invitation um, and to you, Ajay, for moderating the discussion and uh, also to Nicholas uh, now for his uh, very interesting comments. Um, Ajay, uh, well, as Ajay mentioned, uh, we've had many, very many discussions over the years. Uh, the first, actually, I think was back in 2007 in a conference in London. So it's been more than 10 years. But since then, many times and places, uh, probably most in my, in, my, in, my, in my home institution, the University of Aberdeen, Scotland. And 
also in Ajay's institution of JNU in New Delhi, where he kindly invited me on two occasions. Uh, on my second visit to JNU, Ajay invited me to speak at a conference on Maoism and revolutionary violence, which I did, though with many caveats, since I'm neither an expert on Maoism or on revolutionary violence. And uh, the same applies today, although I am flattered to be invited to speak on whether most democracies are more majoritarian. I don't claim any special expertise, and I don't have a clear answer to that question. My own background is in anthropology, and my research has been mostly on Mexico, less on democracy too than on citizenship and civil society, and more recently on societal responses to crime. So perhaps it would be odd if I did have a clear answer to the question posed to the panel, but I will still attempt an answer of sorts uh, before ending with a couple of other points to open up discussion. So uh, to begin with, I'm going to skirt around the long-standing debates about majoritarianism in political theory, uh, which uh, Nicholas has just touched on, and also the polemics about major majoritarianism in, in the media and politics that, that Ajay referred to. Um, instead, I'll suggest that by majoritarian, uh, the panel organizers uh, here, Ajay, means largely cultural nationalism. So arguably all representative democracies are majoritarian in the sense that Nicholas alluded to, that if a majority votes for something, whether in elections or referenda or in the legislature, that majority vote stands for the will of the demos. The term majoritarianism is used uh, first for governments that then claim that the majority vote gives them an absolute mandate to do as they please and to denounce any attempt to limit what they do and especially to consider minority interests as anti-democratic. Even when this happens though, majorities will shift from issue to issue and from moment to moment such that those that are in the minority in one vote may hope to find themselves in the majority at another moment. Cultural nationalism, as a stronger version of majoritarianism, looks to establish more permanent majorities, which at the same time give rise to more permanent minorities who find themselves marked off by enduring cultural markers and thus effectively exiled for politics in the long term. And some have argued that Modi's Hindu nationalism uh, is a case in point. It appears that the panel, that, uh, that the panel organizers will look to question Indian exceptionalism in that regard by asking whether this kind of majoritarianism, exemplified by, by Modi's presidency, is somehow inherent or at least common to democracy. Here, I suppose the image on the poster for the, the round table of Trump supporters supports this, the, the, the thrust of this question. If a, if a beacon of democracy such as the United States turned out to be receptive to majoritarianism, perhaps this is the case of all or at least most democracies. Are those that resist majoritarianism therefore an exception in that regard? Again, I'm, I'm not really in a position to give a definitive answer to that question, but I would suggest that the sample of Modi's Hindu nationalism and uh, Trump's Make America Great Again is hardly a representative one. I'm not sure that Trump is even representative of American democracy, uh, and I doubt very much that Modi's project can be seen as representative of Indian democracy. Indeed, when I was trying to think of countries where minorities have not been consistently sacrificed to settled majorities, it occurred to me that India itself, for much of the past 70 years, is a striking example. And here my, my knowledge of India is, is rather scarce, but I did recently have the pleasure of interviewing uh, one of Ajay's JNU colleagues, Professor Gurpreet Mahajan who in her book, India, the Makings of a Democratic Discourse, 
draws a fascinating contrast between Canada, where there are fierce controversies over the rights accorded to the francophone and indigenous minorities. But what is not disputed is that they are the salient minorities. And India, where there is little consensus over what minorities are worthy of recognition, giving rise to endless claims and counterclaims that can only ever be resolved politically, producing in the process ever new minorities. Reading Professor Mahajan's account of difference in India is, I found exhausting to quote, the difficulty has been compounded by the fact that no community could be unambiguously identified as a majority, not even the Hindus. Within the Hindus, the lower castes, which had been segregated and discriminated against for centuries, could not be categorized with the rest as a majority. They were perhaps the, mo the most vulnerable and marginalized group in society. And Professor Mahajan goes on to observe, the situation becomes even more complicated, became even more complicated after the linguistic reorganization of states. Now, even among the dominant Hindu caste, Bengali speaking Hindus have become a minority in the state of Tamil Nadu and Telugu speaking Hindus a minority in other states. For Professor Mahajan then, it would seem that until recently, India's challenge, India's problem in that sense has not been the ossification of majorities, but on the contrary, their radical instability. It may be that Modi's Hindu nationalism now looks to establish more permanent majorities with the potential to create more permanent minorities. Yet, this should not lead us to assume that most democracies are majoritarian, nor to assume that India will remain so any more than the United States. So India is my main answer to the question of whether most democracies are majoritarian. My home country of Scotland is a very different example. In, in 1997, the, the Labour government held a referendum which culminated in the devolution of powers to a Scottish government, giving the Scots a way out of being a permanent minority exiled from Westminster politics. Scotland then adopted a system of proportional representation, which, at least in theory, made it harder for a single party to capture government by commanding an electoral majority. I say in theory because the Scottish National Party now has a pretty tight grip on politics without having to resort to coalition government. Yet, the Scottish National Party has achieved its electoral majorities without engaging in majoritarian politics, or at least without the kind of strong majoritarianism which I think the organizers of this panel have in mind. For example, residence and not descent or even birth was the primary criterion for eligibility to vote in the 2014 Scottish independence referendum. Those born in Scotland but living abroad were not eligible to vote in the referendum. EU and Commonwealth citizens resident in Scotland were eligible to vote. Scotland then is a very different example from India of a democracy that is not obviously majoritarian, at least in a strong sense exemplified in cultural nationalism. So um, I'd like to end there with a couple of very different points. Um, first, I began by noting that all representative democracies are majoritarian in the sense that Majoritarian in the sense that if a majority votes for something, whether in elections or referenda or in the legislature, that vote stands for the will of the demos. But in the world today, it's worth pointing out there are attempts to develop democracy that is not representative in that sense, where politics is not decided by electoral and legislative majorities. CISRO, our centre at Aberdeen, is hosting a postdoctoral fellow Hanifi Barris, who is studying Hannah Arendt's model of council democracy, which looks to instances such as the Kibbutzim or the Paris Commune or the 1956 Hungarian Revolutionary Councils to imagine a version of democracy in which minorities are not permanently relegated. Barris extends Arendt's insights to look at ongoing attempts by the Rojava movement in Syria and the Zapatista movement in Mexico to install forms of council democracy where office and policies are decided by forms of consensus. 
those democracies are not majoritarian, or at least that is a claim. A second and final, very different point again, is that the long-term exiling of minorities from politics through the establishing of enduring majorities is only one of the risks of contemporary electoral democracy. Much of my current research, as, as Ajay mentioned, is taken up with crime and corruption in Mexico, which might seem a long way away, but I believe Mexico is a useful prism for trends in electoral democracy elsewhere in the world. Currently, in many parts of the world, savvy electoral operators make a mockery of campaign finance regulation, injecting large amounts of cash of often dubious origin to engineer or manufacture electoral majorities, commonly on behalf of business interests, whether illegal or legal. If majoritarianism ends up exiling minorities from politics, as I've suggested, today's engineered majorities often themselves find themselves cheated at every level of polity from the local right up to the national by these political operators and the legal and illegal business interests that they front. <clears throat> Thanks, Trevor. That was quite spot on in terms of raising very crucial issues that I think we had uh, in mind and uh, Arjun was interested in kind of uh, uh, flagging off because I think his institute puts up these videos on, I don't know, multiple sites and he informed me that the previous uh, round table we did with uh, Samir and others uh, were watched by a couple of thousand over a period of time. He said it's 7,000. I'm presuming he has added a bit, but uh, plus or minus, I think it's it's a, a big number. So I think keeping it uh, open-ended and raising a kind of uh, issues that both you and Nick did, I think uh, should help us because these are the debates that are in the air with uh, quite a few people and especially minorities in India uh, and elsewhere would be interested and were not keenly interested in sort of uh, decoding these terms that are floating around majoritarianism, illiberalism, authoritarianism, and I think uh, hopefully our discussion would uh, allow them to sort of a kind of provide an entry point uh, to sort of uh, enter this debate. So uh, there are already questions, but what we will do is that I will offer a few comments uh, uh, and you would, I would, uh, second round, I would expect you and uh, uh, Nick to sort of come back on my comment, respond, and uh, in the third round, you can go through uh, those questions and uh, uh, pick and choose which of those you would wish to, and I think maybe some who are here can directly ask, I don't know how this technology works, Arjun can explain to us that who is here, who can ask, some are watching on Facebook, I mean, he does all this, so I think Arjun, you should take over after the second round, coordinate this uh, uh, Q&A session. Sure, sure. Of, uh, I, I am collecting from everywhere, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, you can collect questions on Facebook. I don't know who can ask. Uh, some you say cannot access. So uh, you are better off there. I'll just uh, sit back uh, and relax uh, in the right. Q&A. Okay. So a few <laughs> questions, uh, remarks. So I think, uh, Nick, the, uh, the central issue that you really brought out was that uh, a democracy is meant for multiple, even if they're contrasting and contesting voices to coexist together and uh, majoritarianism uh, is something that does not allow for that. Uh, I think this is the contrast we are trying to really uh, draw. Uh, uh, while that's a very useful uh, entry point, but how does one actually uh, uh, make it an operative uh, principle in identifying? Because Trump would say that he is trying to represent those who have not had a voice. Uh, so, at, uh, from a certain uh, point of view, the complication is that it is true that uh, uh, there are certain uh, groups that have been uh, now categorized as dominant, as conservative, uh, who uh, who are otherwise, you know, like this, uh, the white 
but there are whites is also it's not a single datum it's it's a, it's a segregated group there is white working class and there's in indian context as you said there are so is this so my first question would be therefore uh, can we argue that this crisis of majoritarianism uh, can be reinterpreted in terms of uh, uh, raising questions of certain new constituencies uh, which i think liberalism uh, kind of failed to articulate especially the economically weak among the dominant social groups uh, this seems to be i think at somewhere at the heart of what we are referring to as uh, in in the in the american context it would be the white working class as white they are a dominant social group uh, belong to the majority but as working class post neoliberalism they are on a, a downward spike i think a similar case which i think we discussed earlier which you also referred to in your uh, write up you referred to some of my writings where i have argued that in indian case too what uh, that at the heart of the crisis of the current uh, illiberal majoritarianism is articulating the interest of the economically weak among the dominant caste you uh, know i think does liberalism not allow space for those groups and uh, you know because they can't claim the language of rights uh, they can't claim the language of constitutionalism uh, uh, the language of equality also seems to push them out of the picture uh, so it is this dominant groups some call it a cultural backlash uh, some would call it a majoritarian backlash i mean uh, if we avoid that language uh, there seems to be a crisis of expanding democracy to represent those who are so i refer to them as mezzanine elites in, in my own uh, where you know those who are dropouts like social dropouts those who are in peri urban areas or in rural areas you know there are a lot of caste hindus who have lost out after neoliberalism with globalization Uh, but they do not actually have a language to articulate and it seems to be this these groups which are very strongly behind this kind of a, a majoritarian uh, backlash and and uh, and and the kind of language which is beyond citizenship right democracy liberal institutions uh, is something that then the subaltern groups also identify with because liberal institutions kind of fail on the question of equality and which has sort of got exacerbated after neoliberalism therefore there is a kind of a new convergence that is emerging why hindutva is able to represent uh, the the poor the socially mobile among the lower caste the, the economically weak among the dominant social caste so it's actually a new hegemony that that articulates a range of uh, social groups uh, who wish then to identify themselves in a language which is extra institutional which is illiberal which is outside the constitutional fold uh, so on and so forth so i think this is one question that i'm keenly interested in, which which i think is at the heart of what we call majoritarianism yes no i i want uh so let, let me complete my point and then we will uh, we will give you the full <laughs> full time to sort sure. of uh, respond uh the second point is on the question of uh, no the uh, question of civility uh, that you refer to uh, mm -hmm. i think we need to again revisit this question of civility uh, that historically we identified with emergence of civil societies uh, so on and so forth so this equation between civility uh, and you know uh, some kind of foucauldian biopolitical disciplining that has happened uh, i think why is it that increasingly Uh, social groups are turning out to be uncivil in their uh, uh, you think this is something very specific to the current historical gender in the way democracies are playing out did it always exist uh, historically uh, i mean or is it more visible with social media you will find that kind of a uh, uh, people seem to feel more represented through this kind of a uncivil uh, uh, no, exchange Uh, there is something very deep happening there that i have i've not been able to really put my finger on it but uh, you know one of the uh, political theorists political philosophers akil bilgrami uh, you know who is in the us uh, has actually argued that when the rules of the game uh, are not uh, in whichever way you play it, if it is not inclusive uh, then people would throw up the board itself 
So you know, it's like a game of chess. You know, whatever rules you put, if no rule is is able to include them, then they will they might as well break those rules itself than play the game uh, by the rules. So is it then therefore come back to original question? Is it actually a crisis of liberalism that its whole this whole project of citizenship, its whole universal claims? You know, we went over and over this at uh, six rule again and again. Some after a point, this, these questions become very very uh, uh, circular, you know, and we don't seem to make headway. Uh, you know, uh, in spite of a uh, system which uh, Trevor heads is quite an interdisciplinary center from anthropologists to only Trevor. I don't know how he does this magic of uh, forging a dialogue with an anthropologist, psychoanalyst, political philosophers, legal, business school. I mean, you name it, and we are all there, and we still manage to uh, be in a room for two days talking. Uh, but I, even there, I feel that you know these questions after a point become quite circular. My last point would be your emphasis on ability to listen to uh, other voices. Uh, you know, uh, here I think the key uh, uh, issue really seems to be the difference between recognition and prejudice. That what do you do when prejudice is integral to the uh, uh, formulation of recognition of certain groups? that the very idea of white the very idea of being male the very idea of something is integral the way it's formulated has a sense of prejudice and exclusion i think this is something in an epistemic sense we have really not been able to uh, uh, kind of uh, know uh, that this way to withdraw the line between recognition and prejudice uh, what happens when my idea of recognition itself is constituted by certain uh, prejudice then uh, where do I? Uh, Richard Rorty picks up this question, uh, you know, in where, where, uh, where he argues that what we need to eliminate is prejudice and not talk about recognition. That recognition is not a useful way of uh, 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 talking about, but it's about elimination of prejudice. So can we really disassociate question of recognition from question of prejudice because they seem to be so uh, integrally connected uh, to each other? So what I'll do, Nick, is I'll also quickly offer my comments to Trevor, and then uh, we can go over the same order, or if you want to alter, and then both of you can kind of come back uh, like the previous round, and then we can sort of then in the third round open it up for uh, discussion. Sure. Uh, Trevor, yeah. So uh, you you made three, I think, very important points. One is in terms of the idea that. Uh, uh, what you argue is unique to the current uh, majoritarianism is uh, that we are actually manufacturing permanent majorities. Uh, and, uh, uh, and while you also argue that uh, actually these are not numerical majorities in any sense, you're right, you know, in Modi, Narendra Modi, even in his second term, uh, has a, a, a vote share of only 38%. A similar might be the case uh, with uh, Trump. So it is, is it more than in terms of generating majorities? Uh, is the current uh, a political uh, uh, mechanism more about invisibilization of the minority? It is not about generating uh, majorities in any sense, but it is designing uh, a certain politics that invisibilizes uh, minority. I think that's true of Trump. Uh, uh, modus operandi, and that's also true of uh, uh, Narendra Modi here, where uh, their their central thrust is to make religious minorities uh, invisible. Uh, and you are also right that, uh, and I think Nick was uh, spot on when he made uh, the point that uh, uh, you know Trump cannot be credited even with the project of racism because they are what Heidegger would call pure instrumentalists. And I find the same with the Hindu right here. I find them absolutely with no commitment to Hinduism whatsoever, neither in a cultural sense or in any other sense. It is more about an instrumental use of a majority identity rather than some kind of a, uh, you know, uh, a valued commitment to generating or protecting Hinduism, so on and so forth. So what is that this is distinct about this idea of actively uh, invisibilizing uh, uh, minorities? What, what does this mean? And second, you refer to uh, Gurpreet's point about uh, you know, this majorities and minorities are not very stable. There are always minorities within minorities, and that's the 
uh, way multicultural discourse spread from secularism to multiculturalism and then multiculturalism brought in this idea of minorities within minorities. Uh, and therefore, my second point would be, does this signify something which I know I dealt with in my uh, book on uh, uh, populism and on India after Modi was that uh, this actually signifies the limits to politics of difference, whether of the liberal kind or whether of the postmodern, post-structural kind, uh, that this proliferation of differences as a mode of uh, uh, inclusion, uh, I think uh, there is some limit to that notion of uh, difference, what it can accommodate. And therefore, this seems to be really a moment of emphasis on the idea of community and fraternity. Uh, therefore, the idea of community, and we again had this, you know, if you remember in this rule uh, on community and political community, of course, I suggested the idea of community in this sense, but you tweaked it, and we had uh, a whole session on political uh, community. But in this sense of the communitarian sense, I think this is what we are witnessing is really a crisis of bringing back community. So Partha Chatterjee, in, in a very important essay on three modes of power uh, in public culture journal, say, argues that this Hegelian distinction between uh, family, civil society, and state actually suppresses the idea of community. That what it does not leave space for is the idea of community. And that's because uh, capital uh, sort of displaces community and individualizes. Therefore, I think in one sense, it looks like all this uh, ugly majoritarianism, if one is to sort of wade through and find, uh, it seems to be a kind of a cultural existential crisis of uh, finding certain kinds of bounded communities. Of course, Zygmunt Bauman says community is a fantasy, uh, but uh, it looks like this urge to have shared a thought. Uh, I think social differentiation has made it really difficult for us to have a shared a thought. And our common friend, uh, Jeff's, uh, point Jeffrey Alexander at Yale. Uh, he, he is making this similar point in on his uh, in his uh, ideas on civil sphere is precisely this that problem of generating common shared ethos has become so complex in modern complex societies because of social differentiation that uh, there seems to be some kind of a community and urge. So uh, uh, if, if we keep that ugly part, uh, majority and all of that. Uh, that should we uh, now think in terms of ideas of fraternity and uh, community and not simply of differences and rights and this whole competitive language which has sort of uh, sort of uh, i mean it, it has gone too far and therefore i think we have been there is a warning for us here in terms of return to some kind of an idea of community but what would that community be how is it going to differently deal with questions of hierarchy exclusion power uh, is something I think uh, who else but an anthropologist can tell us uh, uh, more than uh, a political theorist. So with those uh, comments, I think I will now request uh, uh, Nick and uh, Trevor to sort of uh, come back on them. Trevor, do you want to go first or should I go first? Okay. Um, well, gosh, gosh, there's so much, there's so so many rich ideas to to discuss here. But let me let me just directly respond to your first, your two points, Ajay, and then I'll pass uh, pass the mic to to Trevor. Uh, the first is about the question of mezzanine elites, and I've never heard that phrase until just now. But I think it's an excellent uh, concept to describe people who, at least in their own minds, were at a higher status than they are now. So, you know, everybody, so when people ask uh, people like make America great again, when exactly are you referring to? Like, there's never been a really good answer to that question. Was it 1870s, 1840s, like 1950s? Like there's never been an exactly clear for Trump supporters what the referent is in make America great again. But I would say, um, again, I'll just stick with the example I know better America, which is the white working class. But, you know, in your own mind, think about the, the mezzanine elites in India. So I definitely think that uh, that Trump appeals to people's worst emotions, and uh, he's not a Democrat. He's not in. He's part of democracy is listening, and Trump is a terrible listener. He's just just he's a ter. I mean, he's a. Um, it, you know, the fact is is that my friend Jacob Levy wrote a really smart article about Trump and and lying, and basically Trump would say a lie and make his subordinates 
repeat the lie. And that was a way that you could stay in Trump's good graces, right? It was a way to sort of just alpha dog, show that you're the boss, that you, you can make your subordinates just tell a straight up falsehood. And so for my friend Jacob Levy, that was a very uh, troublesome sign. And so I think that that's right. Um, so the picture we have for this discussion, there's flags flying that say no more bullshit. I mean, you cannot have a human being filled with, all right, I'm not gonna say anything bad about Trump. That's not the point of the point of this talk, but the point is he's not democratic, right? He represents the worst sort of uh, pull towards, uh, uh, he appeals to the worst of the mezzanine elites of the white working class. So what's the what's the uh, the other alternative? Uh, sometimes the Democrats can do the flip side, and if you ask me, can just be, I, I don't know if just as bad, but certainly bad. And they'll say things like Biden will come into office and he'll say, uh, "My administration is committed to uh, helping everybody recover from COVID, but first we have to help the businesses run by minorities and women." Well. That's not fair, you know. That, that that's not great. So maybe historically, you know, white men have had been privileged, but basically, you're saying like very loudly annou announcing white men are at the bottom of the list. Well, if you ask me, that's kind of pushing the white working class to Trump, right? That's a that's a mistake that the Biden administration and a lot of woke journalists do. Right? They say, I'm not going to listen to Trump supporters. They're racist. I don't, I don't need to listen to them. And the fact is, is that I'm very uh, involved in education debates in America. And as it turns out, I'm friends with lots of Republicans. And they all, as far as I can tell, they all have a complicated relationship with Trump. Right? They, they, they're not cartoons. They're, they're human beings, complicated human beings. So uh, for me, uh, part of democracy is recognizing that people are complicated and refusing to come in with prejudgments about them, prejudices. So um, for me, uh, I've been reading Martin Luther King and one of the things that Martin Luther King was doing near the end of his life was or trying to figure out a way to get uh, poor people's campaigns. And he realized that, th that whites and blacks needed to work together. And uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, at least at a certain point, realized that racism was a tool of rich white people that if you could convince poor white people that they were white rather than poor, you could get them on your side, right? So there's a very cynical deployment of racism. So if you believe in small d democracy, like I do, you have to figure out a way to build coalitions with African-Americans, with Latinx, with white working class, with conservatives, Right, that, that's for me the, uh, it's, a, it's an assemblage of minorities. Everybody's in a minority in some regard. So how do, you, how do you build assemblages that are sort of always changing, but that are open? That's, uh, there's a really excellent question in the uh, chat and I, maybe I can come around to it later. I wanna make sure I get uh, those, go through your points and then, and then go on. All right, so the question of civility um, yes, civility can be a way to shut people up and that's bad, that's bad. But you also have to try to figure out uh, when you're arguing with people, what's your point? Is the point to destroy your opponent or is your a, a way to assert your perspective in such a way that you can eventually become friends? And I think that civic friendship, like what you were just talking about fraternity is very, very important. And so um, my advisor at Johns Hopkins University, William E. Connolly, he would talk about agonistic respect. So agon from the Greek word for contest and respect. So sometimes when people compete against each other, they have a certain respect because the other person brought out the best of them. So that's what I, I mean, if you want to just get Phil talk political theory, I would prefer agonistic respect to civility that you're allowed to disagree with each other. Sometimes people who have been held subordinate are allowed to speak vulgarly with anger outside of the rules of discourse, but the, they, are, they still have to think, what's the point? Is it just to get revenge or is it to build a, a, a beloved community? What Martin Luther King called the beloved community. And I think that's, that's for me the important thing. You gotta, you gotta try to figure out a way, how can you get Trump supporters 
sort of back into the conversation so that they don't feel like they have to do something crazy to be heard. Thanks, Nick. That was that. I think that is the key point. So over to you, Trevor. I don't have that much more to say uh, to, to add to what Nicholas has said and also to your own interesting comments, uh, Ajay. Um, and I can see there's quite a number of interesting questions, the comments in the chat. So I perhaps would simply say that I sympathize with your point uh, Jay, about the proliferation of difference. Um, which I I refer to to your colleague uh, Gopi Mahajan's work on the way difference has proliferated in India specifically, um, creating these minorities within minorities within minorities, ever shifting. And I can certainly take your point that this proliferation of difference has led to or led to a kind of paralysis. Um, and despite, actually, when I, I should say, since uh, Nicholas just mentioned William Connolly, uh, William Connolly actually also visited us at CISRO some three years ago and presented his lectures on, uh, on aspirational fascism uh, here at Aberdeen. But uh, Conley actually has, has you know, a very famous phrase when he writes about the pluralization of pluralism. So one of Conley's concerns was that pluralism can itself become ossified into particular identity positions that you could take up. His call was to then pluralize uh, that pluralism such that those positions then become more fluid and it becomes easier to open up new positions. Well, actually, when I read uh, Professor Mahajan's account of Indian pluralism, uh, I found myself remembering Connolly's phrase, the, plural, the, plural, the pluralization of pluralism, and thinking India sounds like uh, Connolly in action. <laughs> um, however, uh, I again appreciate that this may uh, lead to certain kinds of paralysis and I found your in, your opening comments to interesting, Ajay, about uh, your more sympathetic uh, accounts of 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 Modi's uh, political project. Um, considering how majoritarianism can actually help to unblock uh, politics, uh, I know blockage is also I recall is one of your favorite terms. Um, in some sense, unblock uh, politics, and uh, you gave the example of of, of making possible looking at. Um, I think it was the often corrupt regional elites, uh, the gender question, uh, the, the issue of subcasts within uh, backward castes, uh, which I guess. So um, I, <laughs> without being able to give a clear answer there, um, I certainly find myself in two minds about the, the that particular question that you're raising about uh, the proliferation of difference uh, and with it of, of minorities and uh, whether we should celebrate that proliferation and try to recover it or whether we should uh, be looking to uh, Modi's majoritarian project um, for actually a way out of uh, some of the impasses um, that were reached through that that process. So I think that's uh, probably enough for, for now. You may obviously touch on lots of other issues uh, to do with community, to do with solidarity and so on. Um, but I would rather uh, l l give the, the audience a chance to, to pose some of their questions. So thanks to both of you. I think uh, it's glad that we are all three on the same page that we all broadly kind of agreed uh, that uh, as uh, nick said that uh, ability to include uh, uh, i think of uh, the trump supporters uh, and uh, looking at the nature of social crisis and with trevor i think uh, the limit to uh, politics of difference which is partly the reason why we have 
So good that on some note, uh, we would end with that and we will move on now. Uh, Arjun, if you are around, uh, you would coordinate. I think, I don't know if Trevor and Nick have read the questions. Uh, they can uh, sort of, if uh, if you if you don't want Nick and Trevor, the questions to be read out, you can sort of pick and choose and go in the order that you would like. And there are some guests who are uh, with us live on the show. They would, I think, maybe Pavan, if you wish to come in, you know, uh, feel free. They can directly kind of. Pavan is uh, in Frankfurt. Uh, uh, he, he uh, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, Nick knows uh, Pavan. I think Trevor, you, he does a group. He runs a group on global post-colonial uh, with a common friends. So we have been uh, doing a lot of things together. Uh, so uh, now we can start off with some questions live, uh, Arjun, if you're okay, and then uh, move on to the chat box. Right, sir. I think most of the questions our panelists have also seen, uh, Professor Nicholas and Professor uh, Trevor. You don't have to so, read them out. Yes, I, I think uh, uh, Pawan sir can go first uh -huh. and some some questions. We also have Nikhil uh, joining from Goa. He will uh -huh. also uh, raise uh, just one two minutes. And uh, we also have Professor Hargopal, if you want to come yeah, in. Yeah, I think Professor Hargopal uh, should ask if he's there. Uh, for yes. both Nick and uh, Trevor, Professor yes. Hargopal uh, happens to be accidentally my father. So she. he will... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so he's around keenly listening to us. Uh, he's a known, well-known civil rights activist uh, in, uh, in India. Uh, so uh, he's quite. Uh, so he will come in. I mean, maybe after Pavan, then uh, Professor Gopal, and then if, uh, Nick and other whoever you think Nikhil can come in. Okay? Right, Pavan sir, please over to you. Thank you. It's great to have Professor Hargopal as uh, we grew up reading his books and his uh, the basics of definitions of democracy in India. It's great to see you. I have a, a set of short questions. Um, I think, uh, uh, Trevor, you being an anthropologist, I would like to direct this to you, um, because I think one of the points that Dean surface in the discussion is forms of mobilization. The idea of representation is taken for granted in this discussion, as though when people do represent, their voice is authentic, um, uncontested, and somehow voluntary. And once we start, I mean, in anthropology, there's this great uh, debate on representation, right? So when we, how do we see, how is that, I mean, representation, political representation in the sense that not all groups in a society, say, if you say democracy is a ground zero, all groups in society have equal access to representation or the understanding of the political systems they're part of, right? So I would like you to comment on that. And the second question is uh, directed to Nicholas. Uh, Nicholas, I know your work, you have written for our journal. And I think um, this is very interesting. Oh, I think in the discussions here, when we ask whether all democracies are majoritarian, I think there is an assumption of ground zero democracy. You know, the point I'm trying to make is that what happens to is some kinds of post-colonial democracies, such as Burma, I think of that uh, a democracy there is mostly a democracy based on a bunch of minorities that are being put together. Then the question of democracy begins, right? And there is no ground zero of democracy. There are multiple adaptations and iterations of democracies. And how do we place majoritarianism in a country where different minorities are put together at the birth of the nation? So this brings the question of nationalism into the fold. So these are my two questions. Um, okay, Trevor, do you want to go first? Thank you, Pawan sir. Uh, Prasahar Gopal, would you like to go? Yes, please unmute yourself, sir. Thank um, you. My question is something to do with uh, what uh, Pawan has said. Now, in a democracy, elections have come to literally substitute to democracy. Ele elections are being mistaken. Democracy is a much, a much larger idea than mere elections. But uh, in a country like India, when there is a multi-party system, now a party which manages to get 30% or 33% votes comes to power. And they construct the majority. And they, they, they are supposed to represent the majority while 67% have not chosen them. 
and they superimpose the concept of majority because they got elected on the community and while the community is completely fragmented for example the concept of hindu uh, in fact there is nothing common among the hindus there is so much of difference among the hindus hindu itself is a construction is a social construction now how do we really negotiate with this type of complex question of electoral majority versus the substantive majority in the community number 1 and notion of majority being constructed like what is happening in india in the name of hindu while there is nothing common among the hindus i think this question has to be somewhere negotiated and dealt with when we are defining democracy and the majority nikhil would you like to thank you prasad gopal nikhil would you like to just be brief um yeah no there's a, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of very rich rich food okay. food for discussion i mean uh i don't know the specifics of burma but maybe i could sort of get to to think of a map to to get the issue straight in our head and one issue is that the country has all the power concentrated in one place and then the majority votes to see who's going to hold that lever so the whole country but then there's one lever and another conception of democracy that i like better participatory democracy is that power is distributed throughout the country and i think that when you have a system where as i i don't know the example of burma but i'll just if you have one group that's allowed to gra to grab the lever that's pretty much a recipe for civil war if you ask me right basically there a fight to control that one lever whereas i think that when you uh, study american political thought you realize that part of james madison uh james madison was the is the philosopher politician who who wrote federalist 10 and was arguably the main person of the constitution he realized that the way to stop civil war is to distribute power throughout the country and so for me that that when i think about democracy i try to think about how do you sort of make sure that every group has something in power so if you have something where in um in america where well the the I've been reading about India my thoughts are I could be corrected so please correct me if I understand it uh wrong but basically if you say that like the 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 Hindus get to hold all the power and Muslims are out that's going to lead to a lot of ill will over time right that's 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 either active war or suppressed war but you're always going to have people who are alienated from the the system and the same point the same applies to uh to dalits too that if they are never allowed to hold power and there there's no other system for them to hold power that's that's also a form of war whether it's hot or cold but one way or another there's going to be some uh resentment towards it and i think that i think that if you take democracy as a way of life seriously is that you need to try to figure out a way to get people to communicate with one another and um some one of the one of the questions asked about secularism uh so yes secularism in the sense that no one group is allowed to impose their religion or way of life or philosophy on everybody else right it doesn't have to be just religion it could be it could be any kind of way of of living or being that imposes its way of being living or being on everybody else so so in that respect i'm symp sympathetic to secularism but uh as 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 trevor and aj maybe others know is that as a connolly student you realize the problems with secularism because it tries to keep all those issues off the agenda and i don't want to necessarily do do that that i want there to be robust energetic debates within our society um that but there's still respect and there's still this willingness to uh to share power so that's what i mean that's what i'm hoping for in america i don't know india well enough to know if that's possible um but but then i'll just stop talking and i'd like to hear what other people have to say dr stack would you like to briefly comment on yep just briefly then 
so you know I feel, I feel a little out of depth in in, in some of these discussions um, but just to give a, a quick response uh, to agree with uh, Pavan that there are those who are effectively permanently excluded uh, who have always been excluded and it's 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 difficult even to conceive um, how they might be adequately represented in any kind of majority. Again, though, going back to uh, Ajay's original point in his opening remarks, um, that I found interesting his more sympathetic, Ajay's more sympathetic account of of, of of majoritarianism and of the new kinds of electoral alliances that um, that India has seen in in the last five years. So trying to look positively as Ajay did uh, at the new politics and the kind of opportunities it presents, this is where perhaps um, there are Dalit groups, let's say, across the country who in, in some sense feel uh, recognized and empowered through this new politics. But at the same time, to go to, to Professor Paragopal's uh, comments and uh, my greetings also to you, it was uh, my pleasure to meet you some uh, years ago in, in, in New Delhi. Um, and of course, you, you could then easily respond that, but they're being represented as Hindus. And what does that actually mean? Um, so I can see that, and I don't want to get embroiled in these debates, but uh, one might well say, well, what kind of political identity is Hindu anyway? And in what sense should Dalits see themselves as contained within it? Um, so I think I'll probably uh, leave that there. Certainly also uh, in response to Professor Paragopal, um, democracy is, is much more than the elections. Um, and you know, I think that's something that Nicholas has also uh, touched on when he referenced Dewey, for example, in terms of talking about democracy as a way of life, uh, as a way of treating each other, and rather than just an electoral mechanism. That's absolutely true. But elections are still enormously important. And just the enormous amount of energy that goes into elections uh, across the world um, is, I, I think, bears witness to that. There's something about elections that, that really captures people's political imagination across the world, for better or for worse, but there it is. And to, to mention again my, my own uh, closing remark, there's a, a great deal going on during election electoral processes, and here I mean from village level uh, right up to national level, which majoritarian projects, that's certainly one concern, Selling minorities uh, down the river uh, is uh, can follow on from that, but the kinds of business interests, the way that these are brokered through electoral processes, and I, I say this from my knowledge of Mexico, but what little I know about India suggests that uh, something similar is going on. All sorts of business interests are getting brokered through electoral processes which end up manufacturing or engineering majorities. And it may not even matter which majority. <laughs> what really counts is the interests that are then being represented in uh, whatever government comes out of the process. So anyway, that, that's, I think, enough for this point. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Stack. Uh, we have Nikhil joining us from Goa. Nikhil. Kindly come in, please be brief. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arjun, for giving me this opportunity. 
Um, I thank uh, Dr. Trevor, uh, Professor Nicholas, and uh, Dr. J for their valuable insight. Um, I'm a student of, uh, and I, I, I have a very brief question. Um, so when we look at uh, a country like India, where uh, uh, post-independence, we were conceived as a, a pluralist, we are conceived as a pluralist uh, a country, and uh, any doubt regarding that was also you know, completely taken off. I think we sort of lost Nikhil. No problem. Nikhil, can you hear us? Uh, the uh, uh, recent the Citizenship Amendment Act, the NRC, or uh, even uh, the Avri Masjid uh, demotion, uh, or even the fact that uh, never has a Muslim uh, prime minister become, uh, we have had a Muslim prime minister in the country. It, it shows that there is a, a a sort of a majoritarianism that's at play uh, in India. Uh, if you look at uh, the Western countries, uh, if you look at uh, USA itself, uh, even on paper, uh, the United States is a plural country. But um, uh, even uh, actions there, uh, recent actions over there, uh, show that uh, a tone, a majoritarian ideology is at play. And then we have uh, uh, the, uh, the Middle East uh, countries. Uh, we have uh, countries like Pakistan and uh, Sri Lanka, which uh, which very explicitly uh, support a, a, a certain group, uh, maybe uh, Pakistan uh, explicitly supporting the Muslims or uh, Sri Lanka explicitly supporting the Buddhists through their constitution itself. Uh, so they have very explicitly supporting a particular ideology, a majority in ideology in, through their constitution. So I think some connection issues, no problem. Ajay sir, uh, how should we proceed? Would you like to comment first? Because questions our panelists also know, then we go forward to a way forward round to two minutes. And uh, panelists can also- Yeah, I think they can. They can. Yes. Well, okay. I think Nick and uh, Trevor, we have read uh, those in the chat box. Why don't you like go over uh, a specific question that you wish to take? And then, uh, then we'll see. I mean, I think once they answer them, and then we can sort of see what we need to do, how to yes. wind it up. Yes, and then towards also we can have some way forward from Professor Hargopal also. Yeah, yes. yeah, sure, sure. Yes, so yes. Professor Nicholas Tempi. Yes, why not you proceed? Okay, yeah, no, these are these are really wonderful questions, and I uh, I saved them, and I'll I need to think more uh, about them. But I think that the question that uh, Mr. Jacob was was raising are, is very very. Uh, sharp and the question is that you know is there a diff with well, the point that a muslim has never been a, a prime minister in india and you know i would love to just a question i would have for for people who live in india is that is what do they think in their lifetime are they going to see a muslim prime minister and i've been reading uh, african american political thought from about a century ago i've been reading marcus garvey and web du bois and both of them just say they both, it's amazing, they both mentioned that there'll never be a, a black president of the United States, right? They both think about it and then they just simply can't uh, imagine it. A um, uh, hundred years ago, every Supreme Court justice was Protestant. Okay, so now you move forward to, the, to 2021, America's had an African-American president and um, I, well, it's, it's a little bit tricky with Gorsuch, but basically five, uh, five of the judges, I believe, are Catholic, two of them are uh, Jewish, and one is Catholic Protestant. Gorsuch is a little bit tricky to find out. But the point is, is that uh, America changed, that we, we, norms changed. So I would like to think that perhaps a Muslim could become president of India or prime minister of India. I don't know enough. I don't know if that's realistic, but I mean, the elections do matter. And the reason that they matter is because they generate a, con a conversation about people, about the direction of the society. So, uh, you know, democracy is not against elections. That some for some decisions you need centers of power. Sometimes you need that one lever. Sometimes you need those other little levers to have elections. So 
elections are a good technology to choose who's going to be in, uh, in charge. Um, for the democratic view is that the interests that people have change. And, um, you know, at some points, maybe uh, white identity or Hindutva or I'm not equating them by the way, but, but anyhow, the point is, is that sometimes that will be the overriding concern that people have for elections, but things change, you know, that, that uh, at a certain point, Americans don't care. You know, if you ask most Americans, tell us the ethnicity of Kamala Harris, I would, I would guess 90% of Americans could not get it, guess it accurately, right? So um, if the, to the question, are, they, are there different kinds of majoritarianism? Are some more dangerous than others? I would say, yeah. I would say that people who want their team to win and triumph and defeat the other side, that's a dangerous majoritarianism. A more fluid majoritarianism that says, all right, the public is allowed to form and find somebody who can represent us and maybe this the identity will change over time. That's a better majoritarianism. Um, so I'll wrap my comment up there, uh, uh, Dr. Stack. Thank you, yes. Professor Stack, please. So, uh, I think I may just respond to one of the comments in, in the chat, um, which is, uh, I just don't see the name. Uh, but, uh, the question was, if, if, if you mean majoritarianism is bad, then what is the alternative? Actually, what, what, what I'm really gonna say simply is, is, do I mean that majoritarianism is bad to begin with? And, I would again say that this depends on what what we mean by majoritarianism in the first place. So there are, I would say, three versions of majoritarianism which have come out in our discussion. The first is probably axiomatic to representative democracy, which is that the majority vote stands for the will of the demos. Is this bad? Probably many of us would say it's not. Um, although it's worth recalling, as I, as I did, that those in favor of versions of council democracy, and I mentioned the, the Rojava movement uh, and the Mexican Zapatistas at my uh, our postdoctoral fellow, Annie Vibaris' study, uh, they would suggest that representative democracy itself with its notion of majority votes uh, is, is already an issue. The second version then of majoritarianism is in the sense of governments who claim that the majority of votes gives them an absolute mandate to do as they please. This is, I think, one of the games that, that Trump played and that uh, several other world leaders uh, have done as well. And they use this we have the mandate to do as they please and to denounce as anti-democratic um, any attempts to confront them. Is this bad? Well, it's, I would say, bad to the extent that minority protection, minority rights get sacrificed in the process. But there may be circumstances in which that kind of majoritarianism enable some kind of openings or unblockings of, again, the kind that Ajay was suggesting for, for India. Majoritarian, majoritarianism in the third sense uh, is exemplified, as I suggested, by cultural nationalism, where these majorities then become ossified um, and are in risk of becoming permanent, of becoming enduring majorities with the effect that those in minority find themselves excluded, not just during the electoral period in the way that let's say US liberals were excluded and, uh, and exiled uh, under the Trump presidency, but in a much longer time frame, um, becoming therefore uh, permanent mi mi minorities 
And this, I would say, is unequivocally bad, at least in terms of anything that would one would one would want to call democracy uh, beyond simple electioneering goals. So that would be my response, at least to the question of whether majoritarianism is is always bad in the first place. That it depends which which of those three senses of majoritarianism uh, we we take. Ajay sir, what do you like to? So there are many questions also posed to you. No, I think today is uh, Nick and Trevor's day. I don't wish to answer uh, any question. It is. They are under the spot. Uh, I will pass them maybe for another day, uh, Arjun. We can, uh, because they should be answering. I'm, I'm always here around, so uh, we can skip forward. But, uh, uh, so we, we can kind of conclude by arguing that we uh, had a broad kind of an agreement that uh, majoritarianism is actually more fluid than what we actually think, that the many things happening under this uh, large rubric called uh, majoritarianism, some that we might want to interrogate, some which are uh, uh, which are uh, more explicitly uh, authoritarian. Uh, but one question I would have to, before signing off would be that uh, in order to understand this, are we uh, more theoretically and philosophically moving towards uh, being more eclectic in our choices? You know, uh, when I and Trevor <coughs> started to debate, I used to always tell Trevor he's a fundamentalist agnost. You know, so, but today it looks like we've come a full circle where we are all uh, agnostic in our uh, political views and choices. We are all moving increasingly in terms of eclectical. Uh, many of the things that I was so sure of when I did my first book uh, sort of got unsettled so fast that you know today we are rethinking uh, in terms of uh, fresh questions. Uh, that's why I think Trevor was a, a subconscious uh, influence of opening up, you know, this kind of uh, agnostic uh, kind of. Uh, so my question would be uh, 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 less political, but more in terms of an academic uh, curiosity to both Trevor and uh, uh, Nick uh, would be in their own uh, uh, no academic journey. Uh, are they finding this existential dilemma that I seem to be finding that one day you're talking about psychoanalysis, the other day you're talking about not individual ethics, but collective. Then we are talking about uh, uh, philosophy. And even in that, I thought critical theory, but we are undoing. So there is a kind of a Derridean self-contradictory thing. We seem to be uh, you know, uh, uh, moving in a very eclectical mode. We, we are able to only capture certain uh, snapshots of the reality. Uh, in one sense, um, we were already told the incredulity of uh, meta narratives. Uh, we got liberated from producing uh, meta theories. Uh, but uh, uh, are you also finding that both of you in your own academic journeys that uh, uh, that we are not able to find ourselves in settled uh, theoretical or philosophical frames? You know, the moment you think you've got something. Uh, I was also sharing this with uh, Jeff uh, Trevor the other day. You know, I was quite uh, momentarily influenced by his cultural sociology frame, but then you find so many things that really can't be explained uh, through that kind of an, uh, cultural sociology, through cultural codes, and uh, uh, that is completely divested from questions of political economy. So there is a time when we suddenly end up with a more fundamental political economy, corporatization, financial capitalism. There are days when you end up with psychoanalysis. We talk about other no suburban barbers and King Kongs. Uh, so I mean, we are seem to be floating around, really lost. Of course, we are able to capture certain snapshots. We are able to capture certain moments. But uh, uh, is it is it a certain kind of a, a limitation of the academic journey that we took? You know, with opening this whole post-truth phenomenon, for instance, itself I find happened much before in the academic world with the relativism and the multiplicity that we all privilege. I don't think Trump alone needs to be blamed for uh, the post-truth. We were all, we all contributed to post-truth uh, by talking about uh, you know, everything being so relative in a more ethical sense. Uh, so uh, in my own academic journey, we are really struggling. You know, We are trying to combine. We are today not confident of rejecting liberalism as we did sometime back. Suddenly we are all 
strong liberals, we want constitutions, we want institutions. Uh, Sometime back, we thought they were all about regulative power and disciplining, but uh, today uh, we are not sure we can do that. Uh, similarly, question of critical theory, psychoanalysis, uh, I'm sure Trevor uh, uh, would recollect uh, psychoanalysis in uh, Sisrul <laughs> in his discussion where uh, Trevor would be impatient with them. <laughs> no, he thought that it doesn't maybe capture much, but today psychoanalysis has come back in such a big way. You know, I'm rereading Adorno, Frankfurt School, and we are back to you know, those uh, uh, questions of sublimation, and but we're not very sure if uh, that's precisely what is happening. So, uh, as final comment uh, before we sort of uh, wrap up, uh, I would say, is it this is my own uh, personal individual problem? Is it something that both of you share with me? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll go first. No, I think I think that um, I think that I think that's a condition of a lot of people in the modern world, Ajay. I don't think you're alone in any sense. Um, uh, you know, things are moving fast. And with, uh, with, tech, with communications and travel, all of a sudden we're all bombarded with problems all around the world. So, you know, uh, I think that's, and certainly uh, for people who, you know, spend their lives in academia thinking about these problems, I mean, it can just be, uh, it can, you know, you can just tons of things to think about. I just had an article accepted yesterday that was about law. I was thinking about legal issues for the past couple of months. And so um, I guess just what I would say is <clears throat> it's exciting, you know, try to enjoy it if you can. And uh, and then sometimes when people say goodbye on emails, they'll sometimes write, take care. And sometimes I'll write that. And, uh, you know, there's, it, it actually means like you need to figure out a way to take care of yourself to keep going. And so one of the philosophical issues I'm very interested in is just, how do we take care of ourselves to keep going? And so, you know, we each got to figure out what works for us, whether it's going for walks, having meals, spending time with loved ones. What, you know, if you follow me on social media, you'll see pictures every weekend of me out in the forest or out by a waterfall or at a zoo or a park or a beach or something. I, I, once a week, I just shut off my theory brain and just be with, in nature with my family. So um, if this is my last comment, I just want to say thank you very much. I really enjoyed this conversation. Trevor, last word to you because I think you are the one who figured all this out much before all of us. <laughs> I, think, I think that's very <laughs> unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's very unlikely and I think it will take me a, a lot of time to process even what we've discussed here today. Um, and I'm very grateful too for all the many comments. It's for me enormously exciting always to engage in some of these issues thinking about india from my very scarce knowledge of india maybe that's an advantage sometimes when we when we're speaking more theoretically um but i always find it an exciting proposition and i uh, look forward to my next visit uh to to gnu and uh, and uh, any other institutions uh, to continue these kind of conversations but so um I think that's all for me for now. And in, in response to Nicholas, yeah, I mean, uh, many of us have little choice about being with our families these days. Uh, in this country, we're currently locked up with them. Uh, I managed to escape from one room to the other uh, to get away from them, but every so often they would be coming in the door. And uh, on the whole, that's also quite an exciting uh, proposition and there's a lot to be said for that. Um, so. With that, I think uh, I'll, I'll leave you. And thanks again to uh, Dr. Kumar uh, for very kindly hosting us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And we really missed you last month, but so good to see you uh, very healthy and uh, back in action. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. And thank you, Professor Nicholas, also. Uh, Ajay, sir, would you like to have a last word and just uh, propose a vote of thanks to all? And we can wrap. Uh, it's really a privilege to hold this discussion, and I really learned a lot. Thank you also, Pawan, sir, for joining. Professor Stack and Professor Tampio. Ajay, sir, over to you. Yes. Yeah, so uh, there are more questions coming in. I see Shivani, you have asked a question, but I think it's late in the day. Maybe yes. you can, yeah, she's my student. She's doing her MPhil. She's working on question of uh, symbolism and majoritarianism. She's looking at uh, uh, symbolism, but I think it's late in the day. Nick, do you want to quickly, not to disappoint her, sort of, just give a, a brief comment. 
So is this the Tashivani Chudhari? Yeah, yeah, Shivani Chaudhary. Yeah, she has a very. Okay. Shivani, you want to briefly ask a question in front of? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. To read. Can you hear us, Shivani? You are you around? Sir, she is outside. What is outside? Outside meaning? I don't think you can ask the question because she is uh, watching. No, sir, screen. she is outside somewhere. Oh, she can't ask. Okay, directly. Okay, okay, okay. okay. So, uh, uh, okay, Nick can then maybe quickly. And also, uh, if uh, Prof. Sargopal is there, we thought he would sort of yes, give. But, him but sir is not here. I was just checking. Oh, he's not. I must have left for his walk. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I would want, I would want to try to, I would want to try to think about the question more. And I think there were several different versions of that question um, about nationalism and about uh, about the, the kind of structure that that a country like India uh, has. So she says at the last year. So they are they forming a larger connection? It might be a made up connection, not real. Um, but this idea of forming a unity and connection now it is recognized is is now recognizable by majority. Is it allowing these forces success? Um, so uh, the French philosopher Henri Bergson said that uh, it's not natural to have a particular habit, but the habit of habit uh, the habit of having habits is normal. So the fact is is that people are going to figure out ways to come together and be and be part of. Uh, a group. So, you know, there's going to be something like nationalism. There's going to be some things that pull people together. Uh, the question is, is it going to be, is, is the border going to be closed or is it going to be perforated? Is the border going to be solid or is it going to be flexible? And for me, um, John Dewey in Democracy and Education talks about the difference between like a democratic group versus a gang. And a gang is solid, doesn't let people in. It's not interested in working with other groups, right? They, like they maybe attack other groups, but they're not interested in, in communication or conjoined communicated action. So the, for me, uh, you know, Indian India is allowed to have an identity. There is allowed, there's allowed to be pride. There's allowed to be patriotism. There's allowed to be culture, music, things like that. Um, but just the, the big question is, is it going to welcome in other groups or is it going to try to push out other groups? And if they're welcoming in, then it's sort of a healthy form of identity. It's pushing people out. And so, you know, the, the question about educated liberal elites is sometimes they um, they underestimate the importance of connections. And um, so one of the one of the challenges is sort of how do you make the connections? And, and I don't know enough about Indian politics to know what Congress or what other political parties could do to sort of give a full fleshed response to the BJP, right? Because the BJP seems to have leadership, seems to have cadres, it seems to have rituals and music and food and movies and songs. And so I think that, I think that uh, the other parties are gonna have to try to figure out how to play that game a little bit. Even if uh, you know, if they're going to be different, they need to be flexible and perforated. Uh, Shivani, do you want to ask your question? Maybe did I answer your question, or you want to ask it again? Yeah, not like I guess you have answered it, but maybe just to add that what provides this unity. Like if you would have seen today's Republic Day parade, or uh, uh, how they were like the parade went on, it was all about unity, like a uh, statue of unity. Then if you will see also about the Ram Mandir, which I'm talking about. So even that they had shown the model of that, and it was that time when all the ministers they just got up and they all clapped, and it was a like they were showing it that okay this is a symbol and you will see the entire public there they were towards it and uh, in, even in terms of economic policies if i will say that uh, there is in that one country one tax so we should have a gst and even in terms of commuting from one place to another now we are moving to a single pass or a single tag that no matter where you travel throughout india there should be one thing so it's a, from travel to uh, economy to even to the cultural symbols so which they are take, talking about how ram and so it, like it should not be basically a religion but maybe a symbol and the symbol of ram that we should all move towards it the values which he shows so it has yeah. become about the values and the 
which is not recognizable by whether you are a Hindu or a Muslim, but you are an Indian and whose dharm should be to follow that, those uh, values. Yeah. Um, well, I, th I think the time is up, but you know, I, I would love to learn more if you want to send me an email to continue the conversation. One of the topics I want to write about is Indian education. And I think that there's, there's talk about national standards and a national curriculum. And I'm in very involved in that conversation in America. And I, um, and uh, I think that's a big problem. You know, I think that in the modern world, we have too much unity. And so I myself am in favor of more flexibility, loose, uh, the Deleuze called the vacuoles of non-communication. Doesn't that you'd have to use that word, but roadblocks, things that don't fit in, the different. You know, I think we need to keep we need to keep some space for difference. I get very nervous about sort of people that all come together and lock arms for a long time. Yes, yes. Professor Nicholas also, my uh, PhD supervisor in JNU was Professor Sukhdev Thorat, who was a chair a chairperson for a University Grant Commission and also Indian Council for Social Science Research and uh, has a very good work on affirmative action, all the top US scholars also. I will also connect if you're working on education in this regard. And yeah. Sarit, so, yes, managing trustee of Indian Institute of Dalit Studies. So uh, very exciting work. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, I think we should wrap. So uh, yeah, you have the final word. It uh, really worked out well having a political philosopher and anthropologist uh, I think uh, we broadly agreed that there are certain trends that we can really observe and put our finger on and theorize, but it's also a very open-ended, fast-changing process, and I think it invites for more dialogue of this kind to make sense of the world uh, we are really living in. And Arjun uh, is a young director, uh, both Nick and uh, Trevor, that uh, you know, he manages his institute and uh, quite a few talks they organize. Uh, I don't know how many, Arjun, you organize <clears throat> weekly three, four talks. I see on Facebook, there's a large number of engagements. He's into policy, legal changes, the mapping, a uh, uh, large number of issues. So thanks to you, Arjun, for also uh, you know, managing uh, this uh, program. And uh, thanks to Pavan, uh, Professor Gopal, others who joined us today uh, enrich our discussions and uh, thanks to both Nick and uh, uh, Trevor. Trevor, I'll be anyway, I hopefully I'll be seeing him soon, uh, meeting either in Aberdeen or uh, I don't know, somewhere in the world. Uh, we will be catching up as soon as this pandemic is over. Yes, uh, sir, we'll take me along. We are anyway in touch through Facebook, so keep in touch and stay safe. Yes, Ajay, sir, also take me along. Okay. Thanks, Arjun. <laughs> okay. Yes. Bye. Yes, Ajay sir really is. I would say uh, genius, and our, our country is also top political scientist and also writer leading. So I thank you, Ajay sir, once again, and all our panelists, uh, Professor Tampio and uh, Professor Stack, and uh, Professor Hargopal also, and uh, all our discussant uh, 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 to join. And we wish you uh, uh, once again a happy Republic Day for India and a good night. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye, Pavan. Bye, Nick. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. Jay. bye Trevor. Bye. Nice meeting you. Bye, bye, Shivani. Nice to meet you too. Bye, Pawan. Have a good night. Bye, Arjun. Thank you. <laughs>